So how does spin affect the game of table tennis? Well, at the basic level, when there's no spin, table tennis is a really nice, simple sport because the target is close to you, uh, your opponent's uh, in front of you, and you're able to just tap the ball backwards and forwards nice and easily. But as soon as you introduce spin, the game has a devil in its tail. Thanks for joining us on the Ask the Coach show this week. Our theme, spin. We've got all our usual segments, so stay with us. I hope you'll enjoy the show. What separates table tennis from other racket sports? Well, all racket sports, you're talking about hitting the ball backwards and forwards, but for me, the real beauty of table tennis is spin. Okay, and uh, what's your favourite type of spin? Oh, for me, top spin because it lets you belt the ball as hard as you want. Okay, and when do you remember first learning about spin? I remember the first time I saw table tennis um, at a very young age of five and seeing the ball spinning and coming back towards me and I thought, oh my goodness, that is just incredible. Wow, and a lot of people uh, don't realise just how much spin you can get these days. What's been the biggest contributing factor technology-wise to make you were able to generate so much spin. Yeah, definitely the table tennis rubber. So uh, having sponge and a grippy rubber on the top lets you generate a whole heap of spin, um, much better than the old hard bats. And I guess that's why some 80 year olds can beat some young fit uh, athletic types. Uh, not just some 80 year olds, a lot of 80 year olds. If you've ever been to a club and seen some of those wily old characters that can just put a little bit of this spin and a little bit of that, um, it makes the game very difficult to control. Now, it's a bit of a, a success story and then some people think it takes away from the game. So what are your opinions on technology and spin and this evolution of the game? I love the game of table tennis as it is now, but I also love the basic game of hard bat table tennis where it's all just pure and it's all about um, your athletic ability and being able to return the ball on the table. Yeah, we've seen uh, the World Table Tennis Championships where they only use the, the sandpaper bats, um, making a bit of a comeback. Do you think that that's going to challenge the, the real game of table tennis? I love it. And wouldn't it be great if we had another form of table tennis um, in, the fa in the form of hard bat or sandpaper or something where the game is standardised. I think you would find a lot of player people in the world just coming out and having a look at this beautiful game. So I guess it would be kind of like Formula One versus a, you know, a second class of uh, racing. Here you've got real table tennis versus hard bat table tennis. Um, yeah, is it Formula One versus in Australia V8s? Um, where the V8 is a car that everyone can drive, whereas the Formula One is something that no one can really drive. You know, is it about the hard bat being something that everyone can do and can relate to? Perhaps. The game has certainly evolved from the days of the hard bat to now using sponge rubbers. So let's have a little chat about how to deal with spin. When you first get to a table tennis club, and people are putting spin on the ball, it can be really bewildering. So what do you need to know? The first thing is you need to know the fact that that's what they're doing, that they're spinning the ball. For example, they might put some side spin on the ball and the ball's shooting off to the side. They might put back spin on the ball and the ball's going straight into the table on your side. They might even put some top spin on the ball and the ball is shooting up off your racket. So to a beginner going to a club, that can be really confusing because it's hard to see what they're doing at the other end of the table, but the ball is spinning wildly. Because the ball is one color with a bit of a label there, you also don't get much information. It just looks like a white ball coming at you and you just can't see the spin on the ball. So Alois, when a player does go to a club for the first time, mm -hmm. what are some tips they need to know about spin? Well, why don't you go up and demonstrate a couple and let's try to explain it to uh, the players. Okay. 
What's happening there is the first time Jeff did that spin, I put my back to the ball and the ball was spinning off at, um, at right angles almost to my bat because of the spin that was on the ball. All I needed to do after that was just adjust the angle of my racket. So by adjusting the angle of my racket, then the ball ended up going in the right direction. So initially it went out there, by adjusting the angle of my racket, it then started to go straight back on the table. Okay, so that is interesting, Alice, because it's all about just adjusting your angle to cope with the spin, but I guess it gets tricky when they suddenly spin the ball a different way. It does, and that's where, again, the game becomes more difficult. So what you will try to do when you learn how to spin is that you're going to be able to do some different motions and get completely different spins, but to the casual observer, they actually look like they're the same thing. And that's why this game is so great. Absolutely. That's why you can take it to whatever level you want to. It's time for Tip of the Week, and today, Alloys has a pretty bold claim. No one can do the same serve to you 10 times in a row where you won't be able to get it back by the 10th try. Alloys, that sounds like a big claim. How do you back that up? All you need to do is understand the principles of returning spin. All right, show me what you mean. Sure. What you need to do is find a good server and get... That's me. That'd be Jeff. And get them <laughs> to do the same serve to you over and over again. Our best tool, a bucket of balls. And now I'm going to get Jeff to return... No, I'm going to get him to serve a tomahawk serve. So I'm going to see if I can return the tomahawk serve. So again, initially, oh, I told you, I told you, I was a good server. I wanted the best server. <laughs> so okay. initially, when Jeff does, I'm feeling a lot of pressure now. <laughs> initially, when Jeff does this serve, and I don't react to it, that's what's going to happen to the ball. Remember. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just change the angle of my racket a little bit to see if that helps. Why are you changing the angle? Because. That's what the ball's doing. The ball is reacting, so it's hitting my bat and going off at that angle. So what I need to do is I need to get that angle back around to here so that that is now facing towards the table. So I'm going to adjust it a bit. Not quite, but I was better. So the first time it went over there, the second time I was over there. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make a big adjustment. Second time. All right, I've got it on the table, but it was a bit edgy. So now I'm going to try and get it right in the middle. So maybe too much. I'm just going to go back that way a little bit. <laughs> I need a better server, really. All right, so I think this is a really good idea if someone's struggling to return someone's serve, see if they can get that person to serve that serve to them 10 times in a row, mm -hmm. make small adjustments, and they should be good. Yep. It's as easy as that. Absolutely. But the problem is that sometimes then they will change up the serve and that's when it gets even trickier. Okay. All right. So there's some things to learn, but you know, uh, that's a good tip. Will that person want to serve that ball to you 10 times in a row? Well, you know, if you are nice to them, if you are friends with them, if you bribe them perhaps, might be the go. All right, so yeah, if you're struggling with a serve, get someone to serve it to you 10 times, the exact same serve in a row, and then you'll learn how to return that serve. And then as I said, once you start mixing it up, well then you're just gonna have to keep developing, recognizing those spins, and you'll get better. Good luck. The drill of the week this week is the double-handed catch. What is the double-handed catch, Alois? Well, this one's just for you, Jeff, because we know how much you like games. So the rules of the double-handed catch are that I've got to serve it, and then you're going to return it, but I need to do a double-handed catch to get the point. OK, so it's a game. You yep. play up to whatever you want. Yep. OK, so maybe you do 10 serves. I'm going to do 11 serves. OK, good. I'm going to do 11 serves, 
and out of those 11, I'm going to see how many times I can serve it. Jeff returns it and I do a double-handed catch. If Jeff misses the return, I also get a point. Yeah, unlikely. Um, but what, what's the point of this? Why a double-handed catch? Okay. What that does is, firstly, it puts a bit of pressure on the receiver. So the receiver's now trying to make a better return. It puts pressure on me as the server to do a better serve that the receiver can't play fast. And then lastly, it gets me into a good position to do the double-handed catch, which means that if I was playing the next shot, I'd be in a good position to play a strong shot. Okay, sounds like a fun drill. Let's give it a go. It is fun, but you're going down. I don't think so. <laughs> One for me. Oh. Yes. Chalk up another one. Oh, yes! <laughs> Three nil. Oh, no! Do I have to turn one over for him? Jeff, you were clearly no good at returning. Maybe we should uh, change roles. Yeah, I guess I should have a go. Um, but what I picked up from the receiving side is that it's difficult if you do a short ball for me to hit it hard enough for you to attack it. And when you play a long, fast one, yeah, then you're in trouble because I can hit it harder. But also, I mean, you, you, you did win a few surprising me with a long, fast serve as well. Yeah, exactly. As a, element of surprise I got away with it the first time I served it long and fast but the second time I served it long and it was a bit high into his forehand I was in big trouble okay so yeah so this is a really good exercise to yeah just work on effective serving absolutely give it a try sure oh, one nil <laughs> oh, this is how it looks oh. Let, let. Yeah. Well, Alois, you certainly surprised me a few times there with some really aggressive returns. Surprise was the element. So I, I've played this game before, so I know that making safe returns just isn't going to cut it. So I went out pretty hard at the return to try to win some of those points. And if you think about it, most of the time, odds are in the server's favour. So, especially if you're playing against a good server, perhaps just um, having, a, having a go at those and taking a few more risks might be the go. Mm, yeah, good advice. Well, I certainly enjoyed that drill. Get out on the table, have a practice of this specific drill, and I'm sure you'll start to improve your serve and your return, learn more about spin, give it a go, you won't regret it. For Remember Me this week, we're going back over 60 years. I found this really interesting and I hope you do too. It was 1952 and the game of table tennis was about to change. The Japanese scientists had been working in the back rooms inventing something very, very sinister. At the World Championships in Bombay, India, they unveiled this sinister new weapon. They gave the weapon to Japanese player Hiroji Sato, who definitely wasn't the best table tennis player in the world. In fact, some players uh, described him as, you know, just a bit knock-kneed, and they couldn't really even understand why he was in the team. But things were about to change. With the sponge rubber, he went out and then was able to win the World Singles Championships 3-0 in the final and changed the game of table tennis as we know it today. Hiroji Sato of Japan, who has not lost a single match since his arrival in Bombay, 
created history by becoming the men's singles champion of the world in his very first attempt. He won in three straight games against Joseph Kozian of Hungary. He was more surprised than anyone else when he found himself the world singles champion. And uh, he was uh, received by a million people, they say, who lined the streets of Tokyo to greet back their first world champion, not only in table tennis, but in any athletic sports ever. Well, Alois, that was really interesting to see Hiroji playing, winning the world championships. What surprised me was that he wasn't very aggressive with that sponge rubber. Yeah, he was almost going back and chopping, really, wasn't it? All my um, visions of what I thought would happen was that, you know, he'd be out there and doing these top spins for the first time with, uh, with the sponge rubber. But yes, just the subtle variation with the, um, the spin that was coming from the sponge uh, really threw everyone in the world. Yeah, and I guess what was really different was just the sound. That sponge was almost like no sound, so people just weren't used to that, and I guess that threw off their senses a lot. Yeah, and sound is such an important part of uh, our game, and when you hear the hard bats playing, uh, I think that's one of the really appealing things about it too, and just the rhythm of that tatak, 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 whereas suddenly, Hiroji Sato appears with a bat that isn't making any sound, that would have really thrown his opponents off as well. Yeah, and I guess we have to remember, it wasn't a sponge bat like we play with today. It wasn't, you know, this super grippy. So, yeah. you know, technology evolves, I guess, slowly is one way to put it. Yeah, and it wasn't even the rubber on the surface. It was almost like if you take the, the rubber off the top and you've just got the sponge, you know, when you... When you um, rip off the rubber off um, those cheap bats and it's got a layer of sponge but this was just a bit thicker so with that just being able to spin the ball change the timing uh, change the sound of the game world champion there you go what a great uh, trip down memory lane it's only a couple of weeks away now so for the tournament wrap this week we're going to talk about the Olympic Games Alois, the ITTF have released the confirmed players' rankings list as of July 14th. So it lists the rankings of everyone who's qualified for the Olympic Games. Anything interesting pop out to you? Well, firstly, the fact that they released that list because uh, they're not going to um, take the figures from this list officially. The official date is the 1st of August. But the thing is that there's not going to be any tournaments between now and the 1st of August. So I think we could almost take this list as the seedings for uh, the Olympics. Wow, very interestingly. And I guess no surprises, Ma Long in at number one in the men's mm. and Ding Ning for the women. Absolutely. So uh, the, um, the two Chinese players in the men's, Ma Long and Zhang Ji Ke, head up the list, um, ranked number one and number four in the world, but they are the top two players at the Olympics. Following on from that, of Chirov, the great European hope. Um, Jun Mizutani, Chuang Chiyuan, Wong Chun Tin um, up really high. Um, Samsonov um, comes in next at number seven. Wouldn't that be a nice story? The European um, elder statesman um, getting up. Any chance of Samsonov winning the Olympics, Alois? I uh, wouldn't be going and uh, betting too much on it there, Jeffrey. No, no. Um, so just rounding out the top 10, Jung Young Sik from Korea, uh, Marcos Freitas from Portugal, number nine, and then here's another one, Timo Boll, number 10, yes. Go Timo. Again, that would be a uh, you know, wonderful story for Europe if uh, Timo Boll could get up and win. Yes, it would be wonderful for, for Europe, um, but you know, the strength is really at the top there. Ma Long, Zhang Ji Ke. It's hard, it's hard to go past that. Yeah, it's interesting. Now, um, did any other players stand out for you? I mean, what, I was surprised uh, Jung Jung Sik from Korea, number eight now. That's an impressive performance for him. He's really rising up, one to look out for. Yeah, we saw him at the Australian Open last year and uh, saw how good he was. But, you know, at the time, didn't think, wow, he's going to be a top ten in the world player. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is pretty impressive. So now he's currently ranked number ten in the world, but for the um, Olympics, goes in at number eight. So, you know, he's seated to make the quarterfinal. That's that's pretty big uh, stuff by Jung Young-sik. Yep, and then uh, Jonas Panagiotis, I never pronounced his name correctly. <laughs> uh, that's going to be uh, 
crowd pleaser. Yeah, Jonas uh, in there at number uh, 19 seed. Um, according to this, Pargarell at number 22, one of our favourites. And then, uh, you know, goes down to um, Toriola, a former Commonwealth Games singles champion, in at 54. Um, and, what about uh, the Aussies? Yeah, the Aussies are in there. So David Powell in at 66. Um, Chris Yan in at 68. And then the US players in there as well. Kanak Ja and Yijun Feng at 64 and 65. So they're, they're not tipped to win, let me tell you. Okay. And then one other group of players I'd like to point out that have done really well recently and just, you know, long outsiders, but the English allies. Ah, yes, the English players. We saw how great they were at the World Championships. Let me just uh, see where they've come in. So Liam Pitchford uh, in at number 33 and Paul Drinkle in at number 38. So a fair way down the list, but we saw their exploits at the World Teams Championships. It would be an interesting uh, draw. It would be interesting to see who cops them early in the draw. Absolutely, yeah. People will not want to be coming up against those players, let me tell you. All right, uh, let's look at the women's alloys. Um, who rounds out the top 10 for the women? Well, probably the, the surprising thing here is that China isn't top two. So Ding Ying, as you said earlier, is the number one seed, but Feng Chian Wei from Singapore in at number two seed. Um, Li Xiaojia at number three. So, yeah, that, that is interesting for me. And it does really make you question their decision about who they've selected for the world. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I mean, yeah, Lushi Wen sitting at home um, would definitely have been um, in the top seed. So there you go. And anyway, I, I think, you know, Ding Ning, uh, Li Jiajie are probably favourite still. Feng Chen Wei is, is good, but I think that, you know, in the big, uh, big stage of the Olympics, I, don't, I don't, can't see her getting up. Um, so the other players that round out the top 10, so Japan really strong there with um, uh, Kazumi Ishikawa and Ai Fukuhara uh, at number four and five. Han Ying from Germany at number six. Jun Ji Hee from Korea at seven. Chen Yi Ching from Taipei, number eight. Yu Meng Yu from Singapore, so the other Singapore player, in at number nine. And number 10, here we go, Patricia Solia from Germany. So, um, so two Germans in the top 10, two Japanese in the top 10, two Chinese, Taipei, and, uh, and there we go. So it's Singapore. interesting there, it seems like in the women's game, more dominated by the Asian countries, that top 10, um, and even, you know, Germany, Hang Ying. Um, yeah, absolutely. Of Asian origin. Yeah, and, and, it's, and it always seems to be the way that, um, I mean, China has been really unbeatable at, um, at the top for a very, very long time. You know, in the men's, you know, Sweden had a bit of a go at, up top and there were a few other European countries that challenged the Chinese for a while, but in the women's, they just, they have just been number one. There we go. All right, so um, yeah, that is the uh, list. There will be an official uh, version coming out. When is that, uh, On the 1st of August is the official ranking list that they will use. But basically, this is it. Yeah, okay, so everybody start getting excited. The Olympics, very close now. It's now time for the questions. And remember that you can ask your own table tennis question using the Ask the Coach section of the Ping Skills website. First question is from Xavier Alois. He says, every time I try and hit a spinny serve, it bounces off. Yet I watch more experienced players look like they're doing the same return and do they just touch it back on the net? What is going on and what can Xavier do to get better? Yeah, so Xavier is a pretty new player, um, just gone down to a club. Um, something that we really covered earlier in the show. And you know, Xavier just needs to understand firstly what's happening to the ball and then to be able to use his uh, bat like a rudder to just steer that ball back. So whatever spins on the ball, just changing the angle of the bat to get the ball back. So if there's topspin, need to go over. If there's backspin, need to come under. If there's sidespin kicking off that way, then I'll need to turn my bat the opposite direction and vice versa. So, so just understanding those basic principles of how you return spin is really crucial. Yeah, and Xavier, try out the tip of the week. See if you can get one of those servers to serve you the exact same serve 10 times 
and just keep making adjustments so that you eventually get it back on the table. Now Carlos has asked us a very interesting question. How do you return Timo Bowles serve? Well, the first thing you need to do, Carlos, is get onto a plane, get to Germany, and see if you can get him to serve to you. But let's have a look at perhaps my Timo Bowles serve. All it is, it's just a pendulum serve. Obviously, Timo Boll does it very, very well. So he can keep that ball short, he can vary the spin on it a lot, but it is a basic pendulum serve. We've got a lot of lessons on the site um, about the pendulum serve. We've got a lot of discussion on the Ask the Coach page as well about the pendulum serve. See if you can access any of that information and that will give you a really good start as to how to return the pendulum serve. The basics are the same as any other serving um, that you're trying to return. It's understanding the type of spin on the ball and then changing the angle of your bat like a rudder to be able to counteract the spin on that ball. So I'm just trying to watch what sort of spin he's putting on the ball and then return it as necessary. So here I can see a little bit of side spin on the ball, so I try and just flick it back. There, a bit of back spin, so I come and push it back. So it's really about watching the contact. There he's hit the ball, a bit of top spin, so I come over the ball. So yeah, just start to watch the contact, see what spin he's putting on the ball. A little bit of back spin and side spin, so I'm gonna push it. So they're the main things, watch the contact, keep focused on the ball, and then adjust your return as necessary. Next up is a question from Tusha, who wants to know what his options are when someone serves short with side spin. Tusha, because we're talking about a pure side spin serve, we do have a few options. Now, you can flick the ball because of the side spin, and you can also just push the ball short. The third option you've got is to push the ball long. So there are quite a few options when they're serving with short side spin. So the flick, the short push, or the long push. Okay, Alois, so when would you use that short push as opposed to the long push or the flick? It really depends on what type of ball you want next. So if you want an open rally, then you're going to make more flicks and rolling the ball over because then your opponent is going to play an, an open ball or a topspin ball or a counter hit at you. But if you want a backspin ball coming to you and if you like that ball, then it's best to play the ball short or if you don't like the other, uh, your opponent attacking at you, then it's much, much better to play the ball short. Now, personally, I find off that side spin serve, it's easier to control it if you're playing the flick. How do you put the backspin on it, but not have the ball pop up high? Yep, so the first thing is have a really soft, relaxed hand to absorb the speed. And then your stroke needs to be more down, more vertical. You don't need to push that ball uh, forward because uh, the ball will fly a bit long. So just come down on the ball really softly and you'll be able to control that ball short. It's not easy to start off with, but it's, it's, um, it's something you can definitely practice. Okay, makes a lot of sense. Tusha, get out there, try those three different options, see which works best for you, but they're your options. So yeah, flick it, push it short, or push it long. Next question is from Josh Nathan, who wants to know, is the banana flick effective against all types of serves? He's seen that alloys at the top level, players are using it all the time. Yeah, well, it almost is um, usable against any type of short serve, um, but let's just show you a little bit about how you can adjust your banana flick to get that ball on the table against different spins. So one of the most important things with the backhand banana flick is to get your elbow forward so you've got room to swing through the ball. Otherwise, you're going to get cramped up and not be able to make a proper stroke. So give yourself room to flick the ball. So let's take a look at the backhand side spin flick against different types of spins. First against the top spin, you don't really need to use it because 
It's already got top spin, so it's kind of easy just to flick it normally. But adding that side spin is a good variation. So you come around the side of the ball, get some side spin on it, and it's just a different view for your opponent. With a side spin serve, it's similar. You can kind of flick it normally. <laughs> not a good example. You can flick it normally though, because it has got the side spin, so it's not gonna go down off your bat, so you've still got a good angle onto the table. And the same thing, if you come around the side of it, just gives a bit of a different uh, ball for your opponent to look at, so it's a good variation to have. Where it really comes into effect is the backspin, because the backspin's gonna hit your bat and go down, so that's a hard ball to attack. But with the, uh, with the side spin, you're gonna negate that by coming around the side of the ball, and that way the backspin doesn't affect as much, you can get a bit of dip, you can get a bit of curve, and it's hard for your opponent. So that's the real power of the backhand side spin flick. Next up is a question from Mars who wants to know, how do I return no spin serves? He's having trouble because he often just returns them high, his opponent smashes them away. It sounds very similar to the question on returning side spin serves, Alois. Yeah, it is really similar. So the only real difference is after now, you don't have to worry about the ball spinning sideways. So the ball has no spin, so you can just come through and flick the ball, and that's probably the best option. But you can also still do the short um, push return or the long push return. So you do have those options. The short push return can be quite, um, quite tricky. What you need to do is come down on the ball. And the hardest part is, because there's no spin on the ball, you need to generate just a little bit of backspin on it just to keep that ball uh, more difficult for the server. If you just push it back easily, then um, the server knows that they've served a no spin serve, you're doing that, they're gonna come in and, and crunch that next ball. So it's, you've really gotta keep that ball nice and tight, nice and low, and see if you can just add a little bit of backspin yourself on the ball um, to make it a bit harder for the server. Sounds good, uh, can you show us some demonstrations? Sure will. So with the, the no spin ball, the ball tends to uh, come through quite slowly as well. So you do need to generate some speed. Let's have a look at the no spin and my flick. So I really need to come forward um, to generate that speed. Um, as we know with the flick, one of the real keys is to get that wrist back at the start. So the other option that we talked about is the short push. Now with this one, as you can see, it's really difficult to keep it nice and low. That one would have popped up a little bit too high and Jeff would have been able to come in and play that quite strong. I really need to come down on that uh, ball a lot. And that's starting to generate a little bit more backspin. And now we're trying, starting to get that ball a little bit lower as well. So keeping it low and adding a little bit of backspin yourself by brushing down on the ball is good. And then the third option is uh, the long push, similar to our previous question about the side spin. So you, ha you have got that option as well. But again, you need to generate all the spin yourself because the ball is just sitting there and floating at you. The next question is from Aaron, who wants to know how to return a chest high backhand ball. He says it's not high enough to smash and it's really awkward for him. Aaron, the key with that height of uh, ball is, as you said, it probably isn't quite high enough to be able to smash. So what you need to do is you need to generate top spin. Now, top spin is the thing that helps the ball to drag down onto the table. If you don't put topspin on the ball, then the ball is just gonna end up sailing off the end of the table. So, so let's just have a look. So we're really trying to come up and over the top of that ball to generate topspin still, even though the ball is up quite high. So that's what you really need to be doing, generating topspin with a good backhand swing. When the ball's up higher, you don't need to start too low. You can start with your bat up a little bit higher and come more forward and over the top of the ball. And as part of a new segment this week, we're going to talk about some of the mail we received from you guys after watching last week's show. 
Alois, we got a bit of feedback from last show. Um, Sean gave us some great tips on wearing clothes. Yes, exactly. So we, um, we, we talked a lot in the last show about um, you know, getting to a new club and what you need to do. So what Sean mentioned was don't wear a white shirt and that's a really good tip because uh, the white ball, white shirt, so in, in clubs or in tournaments you're not allowed to wear um, the, um, a white shirt if they're playing with a white ball. Yeah, it actually says you're not allowed to wear the same colour shirt as the ball. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, just avoid wearing um, white shirts. Uh, as, as a good tip. Well yeah. done, Sean. Thank yep. you. And, and he had some other good points. Alan. Yeah, so he also said, you know, go there with a really positive attitude and don't be um, scared to ask questions. Um, he, yeah, he, he, wanted, he wanted you to be um, a little bit more re, um, progressive or, you know, just, just out there a little bit more. But also really listen to what the other um, people say. Yeah, yeah, so don't just sit around and wait for someone to ask you to hit. Go and ask them for a hit. And if you're playing against someone better, yeah, show that you're enthusiastic. Uh, they're, they're the main tips that he had. Yeah, so Gene also talked um, about that as well. So he said, um, uh, uh, to, uh, relating to Sean's remarks about not being shy and waiting for other people to invite you to playing, um, they might do it a couple of times initially to be polite, mm. um, but it's not the common practice. Show your motivation, ask them to play with you, and if you're just beginning and fear that they will not enjoy or find it interesting for them to play with you, show them that you are serious about learning. So, you know, players do like to help other players and like to see that reaction, you know. So if you are appreciative of um, uh, someone helping you or hitting with you, just, then, then just show that to them as well. And uh, so that's really good by Jean. Yeah, thanks, Jean. Good advice. Um, some other tips about uh, the show for us, so uh, just the music was a little bit loud. We want to hear um, Jeff's uh, graceful tones over it. Graceful, so, that's, that's, yeah. that's how mostly people describe my voice. Yeah, uh, graceful. <laughs> I'll, I'll check with your wife. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that was the only other tip that about, the, yeah. about the and show. And then Arjun, he, uh, he liked your little advice at the end about the uh, disco dancing. So. He, if you haven't seen the end, go to the end of the show last week and Alice has got some tips because he's quite the disco dancer. Really? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, that wraps up another show. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, as always, give us feedback. Love to hear your thoughts and I hope you enjoyed it. And thank you, Alice. Thanks, Jeffrey. We'll see you next time. Remember, if you want your table tennis question answered, head over to pingskills.com and use the Ask the Coach section of the website. Who knows, your question might even get featured on the show. The music for today's show is from the YouTube Audio Library and the song was called Baila Micambia. talking to Alois recently about his disco dancing and he said at the club he goes to a lot of 80 year olds are there just dancing away and I said are some of those 80 year olds better dancers than you? Uh, not just some 80 year olds, a lot of 80 year olds. If you've ever been to a club and seen some of those wily old characters Thanks again for watching and we'll be back next week with another show. Until then, keep enjoying your table tennis.